Hello and a very warm welcome to the latest MTD podcast. My name is Joe Reynolds and I've got 25 years experience in the design, manufacture, application, sales and now marketing of cutting tools. Today I have the pleasure of hosting a podcast with a cutting tool giant. Goering Limited is a wholly owned subsidiary of Goering KG, a company whose 2019 global turnover exceeded 1.1 billion euros, would you believe? We're going to discuss a whole, you know, loads of different things on the podcast, including tool management, uh, cutting tools as a whole, and also the additive manufacturing process. Joining me first is an expert and indeed a true gentleman in the industry, Dave Hudson. Dave joined over 30 years ago and has been national sales manager for 30 years at Goering. He's got 45 years total experience and is one of the longest standing staff at Goering. Dave, welcome. It's obviously a good place to work, Goering. You've been there a while. Absolutely, Joe. Yeah, good morning to you as well. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been interesting over the years. We've continued to grow and continue to bring new products into the, uh, into the portfolio. And I think that's what's kept it interesting, certainly. And, um, and uh, that's probably the main reason why I'm still here. Yeah, and that's what I was going to ask, really. Most people will have come across the name and the brand of Goering, but it's not just about jobber drills anymore, is it? So if you can just tell us about, you know, the portfolio. Yeah, very much so, Joe. Um, I think that's probably what, uh, you know, what's um, been really good over the years. We've always had something new to bring in there year on year when it started from drills initially. Then we had taps and milling cutters and another product came in. And then, um, obviously... We got into the situation where we were we were making our own tools in, in Birmingham and then it went on to PCD and regrind and recope. So there's always been something there that's um that made of interest, certainly. Yeah, and where, where are you in the marketplace? You know, are you heavily into one particular sector or is it a broad brush approach? We were we were we went from general uh, general engineering uh, initially and then probably got very very heavily into the automotive sector. And that's continued to grow and grow. And I don't think there's an automotive plant in the UK now where we haven't got a presence. Um, over the last, certainly, I would say, 10 years, the, the aerospace side of it has grown again. And um, uh, now aside, it's pretty well 50-50 now between aerospace, automotive. And then we, we sell out to, uh, to the uh, general engineering public predominantly through distribution. And, um, and that's why it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good broad brush. Yeah, so so what makes you, you know, I've, I've been around the the, the, Guru, uh, the Guru facility there in Birmingham, and, it, and it's truly remarkable. You know, there's a whole plethora of, of of technology. But do you do you think that's why you're so you're so strong in these OEM car manufacturers because you can you can service them locally? I think very much so. Uh, I mean, that was the main idea of the plant when we first put it together and, and, and moved it. And we had we had two facilities when we were at Castle Bromwich. We brought pre CD into the fold. Um, and then the whole plan was to put the, the whole lot together into one facility, uh, which is why we did, and we opened that up in the spring of 2017. Sure. And, and for people for people who know Goering, I'm sure that everyone's used a tap across the years and, and things, but you, you've got a lot of milling products now, haven't you? You know, both you know PCD, which tends to, tends to be more bespoke from time to time. You've also got some face mills from aluminium and obviously one of the world's largest ranges of solid carbide end mills. Yeah, very much so. Um, I think we, when we had we had a company called Holfelder who we, we we bought about ten years ago, and that pretty well got us into into inserts, and they're all bespoke inserts that, that's used um, predominantly in the automotive industry, but um, it uh, it's other things as well. And and obviously, yes, as you as you rightly say, uh, the the other product range has, has has grown and grown. And as I say, one of the areas that we'll be talking to today is uh, is um, the tool management side of it on the vending. Yeah, no, absolutely right. Absolutely right. And you seem to of late. I don't know if it's a coincidence or not, but it seem to of late. You've bought out a lot of new products. You know, when I think of the speed range and, and some of your new drilling systems, and you've got an aluminium, um, you know, long reach aluminium roughing tool. You know, you seem to be bringing out a lot all in one go. I think the thing we've done is we've always brought these products out. I think what we've done now is actually uh, is actually advertised the fact that we've done it. I think there's been a big change within what we've done in in in, in event of marketing um, with these products coming along, and probably, maybe we didn't uh, we undersold it a little bit. And the beauty of it now is we've got somebody on board that can actually market it uh, on that side, which is obviously what Lisa does. So. Yeah, and what is it? 
at the size of that, you've got a massive factory there next to the next to the villa ground. That is the only downside to uh, to <laughs> it. but, it, but it's um, you, you know, what products do you make there? You've mentioned PCD, but obviously, you know, clearly it's a lot more than just PCD, very much so. Um, I mean, we've got uh, we've got a, a multitude of, of carbide, um, particularly anything in carbide, um, we'll make from there. Um, we've got our own coating facility, we've got our own ring grind facility. As I said, we brought the PCD manufacturing facility in with it. So um, it works really well in respect that there's most there's most um, tooling and applications that we can actually do from Birmingham now. So, and on top of that as well, we've also got um, getting on for somewhere between four and five million pounds of standard stock as well. And that's really what has carried us through this, uh, this, this COVID-19 craziness that we've had. Uh, has really been the standard side of it, which has been it's been brilliant. Yeah, you're, you're you're fairly unique, aren't you? Obviously, holding that 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 amount of stock here in the UK for for next day or even same day delivery, I guess. But you're one of the only plants I'm aware of. You can actually get a get a bar, get a, get a lump of carbide, and produce a finished coated tool. There can't be many plants in the UK that can do you know do the whole lot. I think you're probably right. Yeah, I mean, it, not only is it the carbide; it's our own manufactured carbide which we make in Berlin. So we've got numerous grades, and we've got numerous. Um, um, pitch circle diameter and hold uh, for three coolant um, applications. Um, we've got uh, we've got our own um, uh, CNC mill turn centre that we can make bodies in the conventional way, and now we've obviously got the 3D metal printing for doing it in something a little bit different. Yeah, no, exactly. And it's you know you've mentioned you mentioned tool management, and, and at this stage I'd like to introduce Lee Austin, who heads up tool management, and you know and vending for growing. And Lee's got twenty years electrical and mechanical engineering experience, and has been with uh, growing for six and a half years now. So Lee, welcome to the podcast. But can we just start with you know fundamentally what is tool management? It's a lot more than just vending machines, isn't it? Yes, of course. Um, the concept of Tool management basically is transparency of costs and your tools, basically, you know, your usage and being clear on what you're using, what you're buying in, um, and basically managing your stock so you're not sitting on stock for 12, 18 months that you don't use. Yeah, no, it's you know, it, it sounds good to me. It sounds good. But where... Obviously, I know at Goering you've got, uh, I would call them software engineers. I don't know what you would call them. But, you know, in terms of your software integration, where what part, in terms of the manufacturing process, where does it start and where does it finish? You know, obviously you order a tool, you put it in the vending machine. Where, where does it go from there? Okay, so like customers got one of the uh, tool management machines in their premises. Basically, they'll order the tool from, for example, Goering. You can book it in. Um, and then you've got traceability, basically, of who's using that tool, what job it's been used on, uh, if you want to take it further, how many times it's been used. Like without one of these machines, for example, we go into a lot of customers that the tools are just kept on shelves and it's basically a free-for-all. So, for example, a customer could buy 10 new tools in, put them on the shelf, the users will go up, take them, they don't know where they've been used, on what machine, on what job. There's no traceability of it. But by having one of the, using the software, the Gearing GTMS, you have, they're locked away in the vendor machines and you've got full traceability of everything in that tool life. Um, um, so where's the human intervention that, in terms of, is, is it when you, you come to raise an invoice or when you come to reorder, is there any human intervention there or, or is it like a, a software process? No, it's all done through the software. Basically, you have a minimum level. The idea of the, the vending machines, basically, you should never run out of a tool if it's managed properly. And whenever we install these machines, we always tell the customer, you have to manage the machine as well. It's not a magic box. Um, if it's managed bad, badly, it reflects badly on the software because we always get told the software's not working. And with the traceability of it, we can always find out that actually it's not the software's fault, it's being managed wrong. So then we'll do extra training. So basically, when you fill the machine with the tools, it will when it gets to a, a min level, uh, depending on the usage, um, it'll send an order either to the purchasing department of the company or it can go straight to the supplier. So then them tools will be delivered and you'll still have enough in stock so it doesn't run out 
Uh, that's interesting. And, and you talk about MinMax. Is that something Goering decide on or the company? Or does the software say, well, you use two a week, therefore we recommend you keep six? To start with, we implement the customer um, will decide. They'll know the usage of what they use. They'll decide the min-max levels. Um, and then <clears throat> further on down the line, after a certain period, six months, you can actually do that, integrate that with the software, just by simply putting in the dates, what you've used in the past six months, and it will tell you how many you'll need for the next six months. Yeah, that's really good, isn't it? That's really good. And it's, at some level, I presume, you know, the people in the CAD office or the programming office, they can they can get visibility to see whether there's a, you know, if they need a 10 mil drill for a job, there's, there's a way they can quickly uh, locate, you know, find, well, find out if you've got one essentially or, or if you need to order one. Exactly, yeah. I mean, you can have CAD drawings put on the software. Um, it can also be remotely to office uh, PC. So basically, as you said, the, the CAD door or programmers can sit in the office, log onto the machine, see what they got in stock, actually update the drawings for the tools if there's any changes to it, and all that's kept on the machine. So every transaction that happens is logged onto the software. Brilliant. And, and, and how does it work in, in terms of tooling? Obviously, you've got a large, very large range of cutting tools at Goering, but you don't supply everything. So what happens if they want a, a particular product that you don't supply? Can I have a third-party product in there? Yes. It, what we uh, tend to do with Goering is we'd like the customer to buy the machine because we, if we're doing a tool management project for a customer as a whole, then we'll put the vending machine in for them and manage their tooling like that. But if they buy the machine... Um, then they can put whatever tooling they want in, yeah. And if they want Goering to be the sole supplier, we will negotiate with other suppliers to buy the tooling for the customer. Yeah, and do you know what? I think that's the best way to do it. There's a lot of companies that supply um, vending machines, arguably FOC or or certainly at a very low contribution. And don't get me wrong, that works really well for a number of companies. But I think you get to a stage where you are better off um, you're better off owning the machine, therefore you control, you know, your supply chain, don't you? You've got leverage. You can, you can say, I want this brand, or you can essentially you can put businesses against each other to try and get costs out of a job, can't you? As soon as you sign into, you know, a free vendor machine, I don't know how how easy that becomes. Yeah, I don't think you get anything free in the, <laughs> these days, do you? Um, no, that's that's what we try to push at Gearing. It's flexibility with the customer, and we'll support the customer with the software side of things and the machine, the maintenance. But we encourage the customer that they can put any kind of tools in and Goering's always there to support them. And then this sounds all very, not futuristic, but very high-tech, expensive. Do you have to be, you know, a large blue chip global company to, you know, to, to use this type of technology from Goering? Not at all. Um, I, I put them into big customers uh, in the automotive and aerospace industry, but I'll get more satisfaction putting them into a smaller engineering company because they need to keep tighter control of the costs. Um, And also with these smaller companies as well, we like to encourage them to try and get it integrated with their SAP system or the vision system. So everything that's booked out of the software will read to their network um, and it costs, saves a lot of time and effort for the procurement people. Oh, wow. So you can literally go straight into SAP. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it, to me, it's, it, it's, it's a no-brainer. I know if you go into some European some European countries, that they are like one of the first things they buy after a machine tool, whereas over here, you know, it's not so much. You can spend, you know, £40 an hour is 66p a minute, isn't it? And you can spend 20 minutes looking for a tool. You know, you've lost... You know, you've lost six, seven, ten pound trying to find a tool. So I think, you know, I think it, most companies should in, invest in bending. But I think it's getting better slowly, isn't it? Yes, uh, especially in these current times, I'm getting more requests now from the software side of things um, about reporting and where their tools are going. Um, initially, when you first put them in, they're happy with seeing what's being withdrawn, um, who's using what. But now they're starting to get. They want a lot more on the cost. Like sometimes I will go into a customer and they'll say they put the costs in on the tools. Six months later, they want to find out, they'll phone me up, uh, how much have we spent on this tool? And they haven't put the costs in. 
So that's a big part of the software side is making sure you put all the information in to start with so you get the full transparency of what where the costs are going. Yeah, I can imagine that'd be that'd be frustrating, wouldn't it? That would be frustrating. It, it, no doubt, there's a little bit of work up up front, but when you've done that, it will pay pay dividends. Uh, you know, pay dividends. You know, in years to come. But it's a uh, gr- great speaking with you, and I can see you, you know that your role there is going to get more and more involved. I do genuinely think more and more people are going to look at, at tool management, not just vending, but tool management as a whole. It's got huge potential. And speaking of huge potential, our next guest on the podcast is Alan Pierce. Now, Alan is uh, another highly experienced engineer with 40 years experience in the game. He's actually worked at Goering twice, so it must be a good place to work. And Alan is currently in charge of PCD production at Goering. Welcome, Alan. And just briefly, if you can tell us about the PCD plant in Birmingham and, and what technology you have there on site. Good morning, Joe. Uh, yes, the uh, PCD plant... Um, has been running since uh, 2012. Uh, but we initially first started off with uh, just looking at relapping of uh, PCD tooling. Um, but shortly after that, we realised that we needed to do retipping of tools and also um, new tools as well. Um, so since then, we've uh, we've introduced, as I say, the, the new tooling as well. And obviously now we've got the uh, 3D printed uh, tooling with PCD segments. Yeah, no, I was going to say that. There's um, what, what we haven't mentioned today. You've got uh, what I call a technology centre at Goering in Birmingham, which includes you know Nakamura Y axis lathes. So you've got you know CNC machining centres, and now you've got Mark Four. 3D printer and um, where I want to dig a bit deeper today is obviously 3D printing, additive manufacturing. You know, it's been around, I mean, now 20, 20 years plus, I believe it or not, but it just seems this last 18 months, it's really gained some traction. And I know at Goering, you've had a huge success. So maybe you can tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, with uh, Mark 3D, we had uh, our first um, desktop printer, in May of 2019. Um, Here we could just do uh, plastic prototype tooling. Um, It initially helped us um, for the design of tools so that we could actually see that we can um, manipulate cutters to to manufacture steel body tooling. Uh, Also, we used it for printing various parts, machine parts that are broken that we uh, couldn't attain anymore. Uh, and various other bits like that. And then shortly after that, then we found that we needed a, a Metal X printer. So again, Mark 3D um, supplied us with a uh, Metal X. Uh, that was in uh, September of 2019. Um, here we could now produce um, steel body tools with uh, PCD. Yeah, it's incredible. So, so people aren't aware of additive manufacturing. It's it's layer by layer printing of metal essentially. But so when you look at this tool, I'm presuming you don't know it's been printed before you pick it up. Just to look at it, probably looks very similar to a, a traditionally manufactured tool. Yes, they. You you can see that it is printed because um, you you have obviously like you just said you've got the layers, uh, so you can physically see um, like a series of rings. But this then can be, uh, once it's printed, the tool then goes um, into what we call a a wash. At this stage, it's a a green part. Um, And the part is 20% bigger than the finished article. So tool goes into the wash. It can be in the wash for up to a day, two, three days. You're literally washing the wax out of the part. So once the tool's been washed, we then dry the tool. Again, this can take four hours up to a day. Once the tool's been dried, we weigh the tool. And we must have a reduction of uh, 4% of weight. So this is obviously the wax that we are trying to wash out of the part. Once we've got the correct weight of the tool, we then, uh, this is then classed as a brown part. We can then put this part into the sinter. From then, we um, we can set the software on the sinter, 
and it will sinter for approximately 26 hours. Once the sinter's finished, we then have a hardened part. So the material that we're mainly using at the moment is H13 for our uh, tool bodies. And then this part then, once it's sintered and uh, hardened, we can then grind the, uh, the shank, um, brace segments, and treat it really then just like a normal machine part. <clears throat> Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's crazy, isn't it? If we had this conversation five years ago, you'd you'd be wondering what we're talking about, wasn't you? But it it's all seems to it's you know this technology, it's just incredible. And I've mentioned Dave, you know Dave Hudson, has mentioned to me a couple of times about how it actually it's a better it, it, it this isn't to speed up the manufacturing process. This does actually produce a better tool. It produces a lighter tool. Uh, you know the, the face where you braze the carbide onto it's a bit rougher, which is essentially what you want for a brazed a brazing process. So we're not looking at saving time here. It's actually producing a better tool fundamentally. Yes, I mean it's got so many um, advantages. I mean um, there was one case with one customer. Um, he needed a um, tool designed and on site within one and a half weeks. And the, the only way that we could uh, physically produce this tool was uh, to sinter the, um, sinter the tool body, um, brazer segments, wire, grind, and we supplied within the uh, allotted time. Um, so it, it speeds up um, some of the processes. But as you say, the main factor is the weight. There's a massive reduction in weight. How, how fast? Uh, again, um, an example that I've got, um, we, we, um, we supply a steel body tool and what we wanted to do was a comparison um, of a printed tool. So uh, we supply them with a printed tool and it was literally 25% less weight and wow. it still performed exactly the same. Yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? So, and what are the advantages of having a lighter tool? Well, it really, it's, um, it's I mean, spindle. Yeah, I think from the application side of it, Joe, uh, I think the, the, the weight of the tool is obviously not putting as much stress on the spindle, the bearings coming in from that. Tool change. Tool change again, uh, we found from there. It does, it, does, it does appear to be stronger as well from what we found. I mean, we, you know, we've got good examples now in, in automotive and aerospace. Um, and, and, and we're finding, finding more applications that, you know, where it would be uneconomical to move to PCD with some big carbide tools. Now we're using them as 3D printed tools. They, uh, you, can, you can actually afford to do it. And that's what we've found to date. It's been working quite well in that respect. And, that, and that's the remarkable thing, isn't it? You know, listening to this, it sounds very futuristic, very techy, and dare I say it, very expensive. But arguably, in the right instance, this tool is going to be cheaper than, you know, traditional methods. Absolutely right. We have an example recently, you know, and the beauty of it is, you know, if you wanted to make a, a, a carbide special inserted type tool, it's a it's a it's a it's a lot of it's a lot of uh, uh, CAD work to do on it. It could be steel, it could be machine in the pocket to do all that. We're doing none of that, so you can put into PCD from an application point of view far far easier than you can if you were trying with carbide. And as a result, you know, obviously that's that's helps with the cost because you're putting you're not putting as much time into the job. So your, your your labor costs are obviously lower. Yeah, and and but to me that the the biggest biggest uh, advantage of additive manufacturing in general, not just this, but in general, is the fact that you can design what you want. You know, when I when I used to design milling bodies, you'd spend more more time trying to get coolant to the correct place, you know, to the correct position, the correct angle, of, you know, onto the insert for various reasons. With additive manufacturing, that, that's all gone. You can put the coolant where you want it. You know, you can drill around corners, essentially, with additive manufacturing. So you can have spiral coolant holes should you need them and things like that. That is the big advantage. That is, that is the main advantage. As you've just said, coolant uh, with PCD tooling is very, very important. And as I say, with the printing, you can literally um, have the coolant coming out in any direction, uh, anyway, um, as long as you can draw the part, you can print the part. 
Um, we use SolidWorks. Um, so when we're designing the tool, we're already uh, halfway there um, with the uh, the software because with, with the SolidWorks, we can use the, uh, the model to go straight onto the, um, the printer and, and print straight away. Yeah, no program. Is there, if you've done the quote, if you've done the quote nine times out of ten, you're going to model it up anyway, aren't you? And yeah, yeah. I mean, as you say, you, you're giving the customer a drawing. To get that drawing, you've got to do a model, um, and that model um, is 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 part of the uh, part of the software that you can use. Yeah, no, absolutely incredible. And presumably you could send them a plastic one if they weren't quite convinced. That is the, that's the beauty of it. And that is what we, uh, we have been uh, mostly doing. We, uh, we send them a, a plastic part. They can then offer, uh, offer it up to the, uh, the components um, to see if there's any problems, any issues. Um, most recently, I, uh, I done a, a printed part, sent it to the customer, he offered these up to the components and he found that it was one or two mil out. So straight away, we could um, rework the model. Um, and obviously then we went to, uh, to print the, the uh, steel part and again, supplied within a week and a half. But straight yeah. away from the plastic model, he could see where there was the, uh, the problem, where with the drawing, you wouldn't have seen that. Yeah, no, absolutely not. I'm I'm 100% convinced on this technology. I think you'll put you're the first time aware of doing it in the UK, um, but I, I don't think you will be for long because it because it is just a no brainer to me. It really is a no brainer. The the fact that you can produce products quicker, cheaper, and you can essentially you can design for manufacturer. You can design the correct tool for the correct job. So, Alan, m many thanks, many thanks for your time today. And Dave, if I can just quickly come to you to wrap up uh, today's podcast. Gearing, obviously, 2020, it's been, you know, I hate the word unprecedented, but it has been an un unprecedented year. How are, how are Gearing faring and, and what's the future look like? Uh, I think the future looks good. I mean, I was saying that in respect that, you know, nobody really knows. I mean, people have said to me, you know, uh, well, what are we going to do at Christmas? Give me a crystal ball and I'll tell you. It, it is literally that. Um you know, we didn't we didn't see this coming. Nobody saw this coming back in January when we had a sales meeting back there, and we got plans for the year. Since we've moved into the to the site here in 2017, we've seen year on year growth. So this will be the first year that we haven't grown during that period. Um, I think the big the biggest the biggest benefit that we've had maybe over some of the competition is the fact that we are very diverse. Uh, the fact that we've got the standard range that we can call on, and to be fair, the standard range. Although it's down, it's probably down about 20%. Uh, it's the special side of it because of really what's happened within the automotive and the aerospace industry and the aer and the aerospace uh, sub suppliers that are going into that. Uh, but they'll all return and they'll all come up again. It might be a year, it might be two years, but all we know is that we're, we're keeping everything here that we can continue to grow into 2021, 22, and hopefully they're on. Yeah, and would you believe you just had a, a new piece of uh, equipment uh, delivered? We did, yeah, as part of the plan. It was still there. It wasn't cancelled. Um, we had a, a new nine-axis CNC machine. That puts us a total of 12 um, Goering manufactured machines. A lot of people don't realise the fact, but we do make our own machine tools as well as the own cutting tools, as well as our own carbide, and as well as Lee says we're there with the vending machines and the lights. You know, we're a pretty self-sufficient company. And I think that's one of the one of the plus points of Goering is the fact that we can be pretty self-sufficient even the coating machines that we coat on are actually uk manufactured sorry are actually guri manufactured and we have two of those here yeah yeah no, no that's that's where i'll finish up really on today's podcast it's uh Goering, yeah you make cutting tools but you really are true innovators you're, you're unique in that i don't know any other company that manufactures their machines to make their end mills and drills and things so obviously most people use a different uh, one of one of two or three brands. So, so yeah, you are innovators and you are different. But many thanks to the three of you today. It's been a, a great podcast. Uh, and for anyone watching at home that wants to find out more about Goering, obviously there's lots on our web website, mtdcnc.com. Also, obviously, feel free to speak to Goering direct. Their website's dead easy to find. 
but yeah and if you like if you like this podcast it'd mean the world to us if you just liked it and uh, and subscribe to the channel but yeah many thanks for listening at home and until the next time this is the mpd podcast Thanks for listening to the MTD podcast. If you found value in this episode, please subscribe and leave a rating and review. Find more episodes on mtdcnc.com.